And now it's Deborah Cobalt Live. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on Deborah Cobalt Live. And please welcome K.B. Hill, author, uh, with Ava Kaufman, who founded Ava's Heart. And we're going to go through this entire story uh, throughout our interview with these two lovely ladies. Thank you both for joining us. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having, having us. us. <laughs> and you are here to talk about the book, Shark Heart, um, which is an extraordinary uh, story about Ava and her receiving a heart. And honestly, I think Ava's probably the one who can describe what happened. And please um, intersperse yourself, okay? Uh, the two of you just tell us uh, what happened um, in your life some years back where you died. Take it from there. Okay. Um, 13 years ago, well, almost 14 years ago in 20 days, um, I was a successful businesswoman and mother. I had a black belt in Taekwondo. I had been a professional dancer and um, I was strong and fit. And it really all started with a simple rash, believe it or not. I had a hmm. rash that went misdiagnosed as psoriasis. And um, for three months, this kept continuing. And as it continued, my my ability to walk and do things went from me taking dance class every day to needing a walker. So I was on wow. my way to get a muscle biopsy when I fell unconscious, was rushed to the hospital and put on life support. And I was truly given days to live. And the only thing that would save my life would have been a new heart, which was really weird because wow. I never had heart problems before. And so I, um, I, was put on the transplant list as an experiment because I had a rare autoimmune disease called dermatitis, which starts as a rash and then weakens oh. your muscles. And in a period of less than three months, um, it destroyed my heart. So they listed me as an experiment. Wow. I know, right? Crazy. Yeah. I wasn't expected to live. And then in 10 days on my actual birthday, I received a new heart. That's kind of terrifying, right? Um, to know that, I mean, you know, any recipient person who's waiting for a heart, you know, it's got to be a little scary thinking to yourself, gosh, is it going to work? Is it the right match? Well, um, the thing, we're, go ahead. The thing about me was I didn't know that I was waiting for a heart. I know. Yeah. I know because you were in a coma, correct? I, I, well, I was on life support. Then after I got my heart, they woke me up, told me I had a heart and put me in an induced coma for two months. And as I was coming out of the coma, I saw the light. I wanted to follow it. I really just wanted to let go. There is a being, you can call it God or energy or whatever you want to call it, your higher power. And I was ready to let go and follow the light. And then I smelled my 11-year-old daughter, Jade's dirty hair. Mm. And so I mm -hmm. couldn't. And as I was coming out of the coma, when I decided that I couldn't leave my daughter, I made a deal with God and I told him or her, whatever this being is, that if I was able to come back and being my daughter's, my daughter's mom again, the way I was before, I would spend the rest of my life giving back. And the first person that I saw when I opened my eyes was Tina. Yeah, Tina, also known as KB. Um, talk to us a little bit, uh, Tina, about your involvement in all of this, because I know that you went there practically every day to yeah. be with Ava. Boy, what a friend you are, Tina. Please. Everybody, everybody needs a friend like Tina. I, mean, I need a Tina. Please, I need a Tina. A Tina. Um, well, yes, every, every day I went there um, because I thought I don't want her to wake up and have nobody there because mm -hmm. after after when she when she first was taken in there and she was on life support there were all these people there and then slowly but surely everybody stopped coming and I would go every day because I thought if she wakes up I don't want her to wake up and there'd be nobody there and have her think wow you know what did I do to have nobody here in this situation right um and uh we had been good friends for a long time and um the day that they were going to bring her out of the coma another person called and said they were going to wake her up and i got there and a lot of the people were there again and they were standing around the bed and the only place for me to stand was at the edge at the very end of her bed so i was facing her 
Yeah. Uh, and I remember when she um, when she opened her eyes and she was staring at me and her eyes got really big. And I kept saying, Ava, it's Tina. And then I saw her sort of look around and you could tell she was like, oh, my God, what is this? You know, wow. she there was all these people, you know, standing there expecting something. And when she woke up, she couldn't move. She couldn't speak. She was just lying there with these people she knew standing around her, her all happy to see her back, but she didn't know what had happened. Do you remember that moment, Ava? I do. You do. do. I do. I totally, I, I, I swore to myself that I would never let myself forget those awful, horrible feelings so that I, I could just enjoy life. Like all I really wanted to do was to be able to go to the bathroom by myself. You know, it's wow. like you learn about the little things and I literally couldn't move a finger. And so um, um, a couple of years ago, just a couple of years ago, T- Tina gave me a monologue, you know, uh, just a sheet of paper with this monologue that she wrote about what she thought about how I was feeling at that moment. Right, but and, I wrote it back then. Yeah, but yeah, she didn't yeah. give it to me till till later on. And so when I read it, it totally blew my mind because it was exactly how I felt, what I was thinking exactly. And that's when I said to her, we need to write a book. Yes. Oh, and it's beautiful. I'm actually going to get to book to the book in a few moments because I want to sort of stay where we are at the moment. Because every time I hear this story, it's still a little unbelievable to me. Um <laughs> You know, when you um, passed out in your home initially, right, and then you were revived in the ambulance, do we have any idea how long that you may have, uh, you know, flatlined? I have no idea. I mean, it, it was. Told you, yeah. No, I don't. I I really don't know. I just know that my friend David was there and Farah, and they called nine one one, and they must have come really fast. Then I flatlined. They brought me back took me to the hospital. I remember being awake in the hospital and I remember texting my girlfriend, Claire, who lived in, in Florida at the time. And yeah. saying, I think I'm dying. Oh. And that was it. And then I woke up, you know, 10 days later with a new heart. And then I was put in a coma. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about Ava's heart. Um, what is Ava's heart? And it's, clearly grown since you started this. And by the way, I went to one of your extraordinary fundraisers. Well, you and behind me- All of my extraordinary fundraisers, thank you very much. I have, I really have. And what you do, I mean, I remember thinking, how did you put this together? Um, I, the picture behind me, the painting behind me, I bought at the auction. It was, it's by Eamon Harrington, who's since become a friend of mine. I didn't even know. We grew up in the same town in New Jersey. But I- great. Right? I purchased this from him and I love it. And I made sure that it was behind me today for, for our interview. So let's talk about Ava's heart and all the great work that you've done, because to be honest with you, it then leads us to shark heart. Okay. Well, Ava's heart is a 501 C three that when I first um, was able to walk again, I needed to make good on my promise to God. So I, I started volunteering at my transplant center. And it was there that I learned about the inequities in transplant. And I found out that if you can prove that you had pre and post op transplant housing within 30 minutes of your transplant center, you couldn't get listed. And so I saw people get turned away, actually turned away from getting a transplant because there was no way they could afford to stay in LA, which is like one of the most expensive cities in the world for three months or even longer. And Mm -hmm. so I thought, okay, this, this could be um, something that needs to be handled. So I started Avis Heart. I had no idea how to start a 501c3 or what the nonprofit world was like at all. And I've learned a lot since then. And um, I just started it with a disability check. I, I had I, when when I left the hospital, I was in a wheelchair. I was newly divorced and almost broke. My mus- my funds, my money was embezzled by business partners and a family member. And um, but I had my life, and I had the promise that I made to God and my daughter, of course, who 
you know, the love that I have for her is what has given me purpose to do everything. And Jade, I love you so much. Um, and so as mothers, I know you both understand, you know, we feel that yeah. way for our kids. It's like you do anything. And so I overcame the most incredible odds. I mean, I was told I'd never walk again. Um, and yeah. so uh, presently now, what we do is we have, I have two homes. We don't own them. We rent them and we can help five families at a time. And we wow. come and stay. So we save lives. Post-transplant housing is life-saving. And so we, um, we provide them a home away from home. Laura Diaz just did an amazing piece on KTLA called um, Avis House of Miracles. And it's up for some big, um, newscaster award so we're in the finals so i'm very proud of that she's an amazing newscaster and told a beautiful story and um we save at least 20 to 22 people's lives a year and to complete the circle because without the donor there's no story there's no right i would be here without the donor you know there's no transplant centers no transplant surgeries no medications no nothing and Donors deserve to be put to rest with dignity, and many of them can't afford to even cremate their loved one after they've saved three or four lives, oh. sometimes up to 20. So we give small, and I mean very small, like $200 grants, but we've helped 90 families last year with these $200 grants, and that's my way of saying thank you for this incredible gift that I've been given. Absolutely beautiful, Ava. Extraordinary. And you have come quite a long way to helping all of these people. In a little while, I do want to talk also about CJ, who's become a friend. I know about his journey right now. He's in the hospital waiting for a transplant. But for a moment, let me now talk uh, to you, Tina, about this book, Shark Heart, um, that you wrote, of course, with Ava. Talk to us about um, it's, it's a collection of. I, I just want to say one thing. Tina really wrote the book. I okay. was there when she wrote it. I gave her the people to interview. Um, you know, we we worked on the concept of it. But as far as the beautiful language in the book, the prologue, the poems in the book, Tina wrote the book. I was just there with her. So <laughs> the poems are the poems are. I really, are... I really want to make that clear. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. But that's why it says with Ava. It doesn't say and Ava, right? Yeah. And I, I will say um, the poetry is beautiful. And um, I love uh, chapter six. It's a poem, a Prayer for Achievers. I mean, some of the poetry is magnificent. It sort of is the glue, right, from one yeah. story to another. Oh and I God, really I'm love. So, I'm so glad that you that you got that. Yeah, me too. I did. Yeah, I really did. I understood it perfectly. And I, um, it all came together for me once I, once I finally did read the book. Talk to me, Shark Heart. What does Shark Heart mean? Why, the, why that uh, title? And tell me about some of the stories in here that you researched and wrote about. Um, okay. Thank you again for having us. And um, Shark Heart is, is because actually when, um, when Ava said, when she talks about seeing the light, the story that she told me when she woke up was that she felt like she was deep, deep underwater. Mm. And um, she said she felt a lot of pressure and she was deep in the ocean. And that when God was speaking to her, he told her he was going to give her a, a heart that was much stronger than her other heart. And because she was going to need oh. a strong one. And um, so we called it shark heart because the heart of the shark is, is uh, such a force to be reckoned with. You know, there's, there's even a kind of shark that um, its heartbeat is so slow that uh, there, there's something about they, they can live with almost, they can live this an extraordinary amount of time because of the strength of their hearts and that kind of thing. So that's why I came up with the, the title Shark Heart. Um, and uh, so I, I talk a little bit about that um, on, on some of the chapters. I, I put in little things about the strength of the shark and what it means to different cultures because you know we after seeing the movie jaws everybody's like sharks are terrifying but they're actually amazing beautiful creatures that a lot of other cultures really revere yeah um so tell me about some of the stories that appeal to you and how did you write this book did you go interview each person how did this uh turn out 
So Ava would give me the name and phone number of a person. Um, and she would either say something like this person's a doctor or this person is, um, her son passed away. Um, mm -hmm. my very first interview was with Sarah Fisher about her son, right. Cameron Bolton. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was really difficult. I have to tell you that sitting with a lot of these people, um, sometimes after I would finish the interview, I would have to sit for a couple of weeks because I, I couldn't write without sobbing. That's right. And, um, and then I would, I would start to put it together and try to pull in um, their feelings so that when people read it, they really understand what's been given here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's such a testament to human legacy to be a donor, you know? And so um, she was my first interview, Sarah Fisher, and it was extremely difficult. She, mm. um, she cried through a lot of the interview and it was everything, you know, I was like strangling Ugh. myself to not start crying because I didn't want to make it more difficult for her. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I, I found all of the stories to also be somewhat uplifting. And one of the things I talked to everybody about was, um, do you believe in God or some other power? How do you still feel your loved one around you when I'd speak to the donor families? Um, and that would make people's eyes really light up. People would mm. say, yes. And they would tell me these stories about how they knew their loved one was still with them. Um, oh, yeah. CJ told me a story about after he got his heart and he kept hearing a child's voice. He kept hearing a child calling out, where are you? And what he found out was that it was the nephew of his donor. But he was, you know, he, he said, I, I can I can hear this child asking, where are you? Um, and there's a lot wow. of stories like that. And I think that um, the human connection of of that and knowing that life does go on and whether whether you want to look at the scientific aspect of it and know that life goes on through the science of modern medicine and, and what we can do with organ transplants or whether you look at it as this person is is still out there i know it every time i see a rainbow um mm. when sarah fisher's son died at the moment he actually died she said Ugh. the biggest rainbow lit up over the hospital where he was and she knew at that moment that that was him. And whenever she sees one, she thinks of him. And it's funny because now, I mean, we see rainbows. And um, every time I see one now, I think about Cameron. Uh, and I never knew him. Yeah. But I think about him. And um, sometimes I'll pull over on PCH and I'll take a picture and I'll send it to Sarah. And I'll be like, you know, Cameron says hi from the Pacific Coast Highway. Um. Oh, wow. How beautiful. What a, what a connection that you've all made. And, and you mentioned, of course, uh, CJ. Now he is in the hospital. He's waiting for his second heart, right? Um, he's done something extraordinary. In fact, I do want to get him on uh, our show, um, Ava, to talk about what he's doing. I believe that he's got an entire like music studio in he his hospital to, room, yeah. right? Talk to me about that. I, I met CJ eight years ago at UCLA. Yeah at a transplant Christmas party and he's this big strapping gorgeous black man that you know played basketball and is a musician he's married I love his wife she's wonderful it's not like that but as soon as I <laughs> saw him the first thing I said to him was I need a hug and he, yeah. he gives the best hugs but anyway we've become close friends and he's worked with me with Davis Hart and um when he found out he needed a second heart, it was really devastating to all of us. So he's been at UCLA now for seven months waiting for a heart. And um, he set up his room like a music studio and um, he's writing music and trying to stay sane. It's extraordinary the strength that all of you have. And now that you've been through this, how you all connect and you all help one another. Um, I want to talk and dial back a little bit to when you were talking about seeing a light. Uh, many people always ex experience that light when they say that they've gone to the other side or they're on their way to the other side. So many folks will say, eh, it's just a hospital light. 
personally, I believe that it really is uh, going to or on your way to the other side and communicating with that side. I'll give you a brief example. Someone I know that my husband grew up with, um, he absolutely died flatlined on his living room floor. Chain smoker, doesn't believe in much of anything. And boy, when we saw him, we just went back to New Jersey and he was, he was a different person. He was calm. He was peaceful. And he said, Deborah, I went there. I know where I'm going. And this was a guy who was a rough chain smoker and is suddenly just filled with peace. I always feel that sense of peace coming from you, Ava, because I know that you experience that. What is that like? And what do you say to people who say, eh, I don't believe a word of it? Well, you know, people can believe whatever they want to believe, but right. You know, it, it's different for everyone. Like CJ actually flatlined when he talks yeah. about flu and Tina interviewed him and she can talk about that. Um, I, I flatlined at when I was home, but I don't remember any of that. But when I was coming out of the coma, I literally saw the light and I not only felt this incredible presence, but I felt like I was sitting in the palms of these huge hands and I felt mm -hmm. safe and at peace. And it was a beautiful energy and there were colors and I just wanted to go. But it wasn't just wow. that I saw a light. It's like I felt this huge presence. Like it was an energy. And I I just wanted to like, it wrapped itself around me and I wanted to go. And then there was that stinky hair and it pulled me back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Got to give it to the stinky hair of a child, right? You absolutely have to. That'll do it every time. Tina, tell me, um, Ava was mentioning about um, your connection when you spoke with uh, CJ about that moment. Would you tell us about it? Tell our uh, audience. Yeah, sure. Um, so again, most of the people I interviewed, we did discuss this kind of thing. CJ, when he flatlined and it happened to him twice, I call mm -hmm. his chapter into the blue because he right. said he came up above his body and he um, looked down and he saw the doctors and nurses and he knew they were people but they were all these incredible hues of blue, like they were all auras instead of humans. Wow. And he knew who they each were. He knew they were people, but they were represented by this beautiful blue. Um, and, and when he came back, I guess by the time he woke up, there was someone sitting at his bedside with a pad of paper and a pencil saying, you know, you've had this experience. We want to talk to you about it. Um, wow. So, mm. and that's, you know, when people flatline and they have that, that happened to my best friend during a double mastectomy also is that she flatlined and she said she was up above, like sitting at the head of her hospital bed, looking down, but she saw the doctor and both nurses. And when she woke up, she told them, here's what you said when I was, Ooh. and wow. she like, she repeated them swearing and exactly what they said. And then they gave her Narcan and they brought her back. So, wow. um, so there's that aspect of it. And then there's the aspect of, like I said, with Cameron, the donor families and one young woman we spoke to in particular, who I, it was absolutely magical. She, she spoke to us about her brother who became a donor when he was 21 years old. And, um, I said, you know, she cried again through a lot of this. And I said to her, how do you feel him now? And her eyes lit up and she said, oh, you know, the strangest thing happened. She said, just months before he died, he said to our mother, do you believe in reincarnation? And uh, the mm. mother's like, don't be ridiculous because she was very Catholic, very religious. She says, no, it's not, re reincarnation isn't a thing. And he said, well, I think it is. And when I come back, I want to come back as a bird. And she said, the week after he died, they found a huge bright green feather in the middle of their yeah. room floor. And they started to collect them. She said, after that, we would find feathers in his room. She said, our father found one in the factory that he worked at on the floor in front of his machine. Um, and even when, when I wrote that chapter, um, Ava and I were speaking to this other gentleman and he was, he was saying, you know, this chapter gave me shivers reading about the feathers that he left. And um, he went out to his car and there were feathers lying on the ground in front of the door of his car. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. a very, so the family now, you know, they collect feathers and, and um, 
Wow, it's, they're going to have quite a quite a bowl of feathers, I will tell you. <laughs> but no, but I think that that's they, beautiful. I mean, a bright green one in the house, that's strange, you know? Strange, and I, I completely Tina, believe it. Please. I just want to remind Tina of something. After I read the chapter when you came to my house, yeah. uh, and you left to go to your car, you yelled up at my terrace and said, there's a feather on my car. That was, oh. that was Maine. Oh, that was Maine. Yeah, that's right. what I was just saying. He saw that oh, in his car. Okay. Yeah. Now you've done how many interviews total in the book? Who, me? Yeah, in, the, in Shark Heart. Um, this is our first interview, I think, with Shark Heart. Like, no. No, 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 no. How many people did you interview in the book? How many uh, folks did you interview in the book? I believe it was 16. I think so, um, yeah. There were, there were, um, um, two or three doctors. There was a transplant coordinator who used to be a nurse. There was, um, I'm sure she's oh, the CEO of One Legacy. Yeah. And then uh, a friend, friend of ours, Ava, that was in there too. When I, when I went through there, I'm like, oh, hi, Sidra. All right, you know, Sidra, right? yes, some of Ava's friends. Yeah. Right. Sidra's and I love that because it really made it very personal, you know, and I love that it wasn't only the recipients, of course, it was those who had passed, the doctors, her friends, um, it really made an entire full picture for us, the poetry, of course, and photos of the people that you uh, have interviewed. I love that, too, because now, you know, I can I can put a face to all these people that I don't know. And then it leads me to really understand why Ava is so patient, uh, passionate about Ava's heart. Right. Um, Ava, tell us a little bit about the work you're continuing to do with Ava's heart, including raising funds for Ava's heart. Would you please? OK, well, um, we're trying to get a third location because unfortunately I turn too many people away and um, fundraising is really hard. And in, oh, this, yeah. in this environment, it's crazy, crazy hard. And my largest funder just cut my funding by $50,000. So we mm. really need help, any kind of help. So you can go to avisheart.org, A-V-A-S-H-E-A-R-T.org. And you can even just make a $1 donation. We have a campaign called It's Just One, where you donate just $1 a month. And everybody can afford $1 a month. So that would be helpful. But if you can afford more, we have, um, you can sponsor a family for $5,000 for three months, you know, 2500 for, you know, a month and a half. And you can call me personally at 310-779-6616, and I'll really share with you what, what we're doing. But if you go to our website, you'll see families, you'll hear what they have to say about what we're doing, and um, it's life-saving. It's just life-saving. And I did a TED talk about the inequities in transplant that's also on my website. It's called um, What I've Learned Since My Heart Transplant. And just trying to bring awareness to, you know, what it is to be a donor mm -hmm. and give life to someone else. And then, you know, the fact that the organ procurement agencies who make all the money from, you know, procuring the organs, um, are not allowed by law to help donor families financially. And there isn't anybody really doing that that I'm aware of. So, um, you know, laws need to be changed. There's a lot of work to be done. So I told Tina the other day that we need to start a movement called Shark Heart. <laughs> so we're kind of working on that concept right now. I love that. Grab that name and do it because it's actually, um, it's very memorable. Right. Um, very easy to remember, as is Ava's heart, to be honest with you. But shark heart is fantastic. And once you understand the meaning behind it, it's, it's even more um, impactful and memorable. And again, Ava's heart um, with the housing, does, doesn't it also uh, help those who are about to receive a heart? Because if you're in Vegas, right, and you get a call. Well, Las Vegas has no transplant centers. They all come. Right. So, so they all come. Yeah. People in Vegas See, there are different situations. You can either be so sick that you're waiting in the hospital. So like right now, I have two families from the state of Washington. They had to come here before they could even get listed. Mm. You know, they, they were told they would get listed, but there was a chance they couldn't. Neither one of these right. families could afford to get here. I mean, they could get here, but to to stay um, in, 
in Los Angeles for an unknown amount of time. Mm -hmm. so and they're both, and they're, they're, both, they're both here and they both received their transplant. One got a heart and this young girl who's still in the hospital got a heart and a liver. And literally her dad called me crying, saying, you don't know what it's like to know that your daughter's going to die if you can't get her to Los Angeles and you can't afford to do it. Mm. So um, that's what we do. And we don't, have, we don't have enough rooms, excuse my dogs. We don't have enough rooms for all the requests that we get. And 35% of all the transplants in the United States are done in Los Angeles. Yeah, I don't think people realize that. It's an extraordinary center over at Cedars, correct? Is it Cedars, UCLA? Uh, tell me. And, and Keck, but I will tell you, UCLA helps okay. me a very little bit. And when I went to Cedars about what I'm doing, the CEO of Cedars said to me, we are not in the hotel business. And I said, I am not in the hotel business. I am in the helping people get a transplant business. And right, which is why you're doing what you're doing, which is right. quite extraordinary. And, you know, if they don't want to help, you, you're, you're out there to do it yourself. So that's, that's terrific. Exactly right, because I know what it's like. Hmm. Uh, Tina and um, Ava, what's next for both of you? Uh, uh, probably starting our, our Shark Heart movement. Um, mm -hmm. We... Uh, a docu-series. Yeah, we're, we're, we, we have an outlined docu-series and some interest in that. And... Um, we have a we have a little podcast we're doing that we really love. Good, give Shark a shout Heart. out. Yeah, Shark Heart the okay. podcast. <laughs> oh, I love that. Think of all the people that you will be speaking to with Shark Heart the podcast. Love that. Um, but keep us posted, would you please, on anything additional that you're doing. Also, um, shout out to have uh, people go to your website, right, Ava? Ava's Heart dot org. Yes. Um, and I love the idea. A dollar a month. Come on. You know, a dollar a month goes a long way, especially if you've got more people who are saying, I could do that. I think that's terrific. Any uh, books on the horizon for you, Tina? Um, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little while, but I do have another book, another dark thriller that I'm writing because that's kind of what I love to do. Um, yeah. this, is my, this is my last one. It's called Witchy Man. And it's, 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 I mean, her, she write, when I read that book, I, it blew my mind that my friend Tina wrote that. Yeah. I mean, it's it was so dark. <laughs> really I know dark. A, a, a real far, far cry from shark heart, but that's, yeah. what's great about it. Right. They look at you and go, Whoa, that came out of you. So, um, terrific, uh, Tina. I think that's great. I know what you mean. I actually have some friends who write uh, dark thrillers and I'm, I'm almost like, Whoa. Right? What are you thinking in there? It's like, what's going on? So anyway, okay, so you've got another book that uh, may be coming out. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Ava, you had something to say? I just want to thank you, Deborah. Deborah has oh. come to all of my events. She has interviewed, you know, um, and the interviews are on my website called Stories of the Heart. So many of these patients. And um, I just want to thank you and your husband, John, for supporting us. Yeah, well, what you do is incredible. And I'm I'm glad that we circled back to do this again, especially surrounded around this beautiful book, Shark Heart. You've got a lot going on. I feel like it's given new life to you, right? With Shark Heart podcast. Yes. Um, you know, just just it it keeps going. And I love this. And and we will be connecting with CJ uh, down the line in the near future. So I look forward to that too. And hopefully maybe you're gonna have an event so uh, you know, we could we could get some more fundraising going. So thank you both very much for joining us uh ava coffin and uh kb hill uh, appreciate you being here tina um please look up avasheart.org as for our podcast deborah cobalt live you can find us on um youtube on facebook we put it out on instagram some promos and then in the audio version we're on amazon iheart apple Podcasts. just put in deborah cobalt live you will find uh many of our shows there particularly uh this one and just nominated, of course, for a second time for Journalist of the Year for our show. So we're proud Great. about that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm very proud oh, about that because, you. yeah, because it's our, it's my peers who vote on that, you know? It's so it's kind of like the Golden Globes. Um, anyway, so <laughs> thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being here and supporting our show. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.